Filipinos have been very active in contemporary art since the pre-war era, especially in the 50s. And since the 60s, many more developments happened. And it's a scene to be absent because we have so much to show to the world. And I've seen how nations and governments, institutions have supported their art. And um, when I learned of the Venice Biennale uh, some years back and realized that the Philippines had not participated in 51 years, I got interested. I will just ask a um, very simple question on cultural diplomacy. I want to know, uh, I've asked this of NCCA and I will ask it of a DFA because you're not the only agency or department that is, uh, is responsible. Why is the Philippines not represented in the Venice Biennale? Whoever you designate, let's look into the possibility of sending a contingent no matter how small and how uh, because we have we have so much wealth and talent here so i met with secretary de rosario and national commission on culture chair felipe de leon they were very supportive about the idea and that's how we got started we eventually created a um, coordinating committee between and among these agencies of government, including my office. And with a group of just a handful of existing staff, we got to work. And I requested both of them to write uh, Paulo Barata, the head of the uh, Benale, after which we received an official invite from the Philippine government. This is uh, a chance to show to the world what we can contribute to the heritage of humanity through a contribution to world art because we have a distinct identity, um, identity that is shared by all the Filipinos at the same time, identities that are local. In every region, there's a different personality. At the same time, if we look at uh, the Filipinos in general, we can easily identify the Filipinos because we have so many things that we share in terms of character, in terms of form of expression, or even expressiveness. Filipinos are considered one of the most expressive people on earth. And uh, with this means we will be very good in the arts. The world may be missing so much if we do not show this kind of talent of the Filipinos. So this is the reason why we have to return to the Venice Biennale after an absence of 51 years. It was quite difficult in the beginning because this is the first time after 51 years and we don't know whom to contact with possible sources of funding and fortunately we were able to get the cooperation of the Department of Foreign Affairs so we worked together at the Senator Lauren Regarda's office, the Department of Foreign Affairs and the National Commission for Culture. So the National Commission for Culture uh, has a network of experts in art and uh, curatorship and uh, the notion of Philippine culture. Uh, so we contacted the experts and ultimately we were able to invite curatorial proposals. There were 16 curatorial proposals and we invited international judges. There were three judges from abroad and three from the local sector. So we are very happy that we were supported by artists and curators who served in our very distinguished board of jurors Mami Katooka of the Mori Art Museum of Japan, internationally renowned curator, uh, multimedia artist Paul Pfeiffer, who has exhibited in many art uh, institutions of the world, including the House of Kunst, etc., and uh, who has participated, I believe, in an art biennale many years ago uh, here. And um, Sid Reyes, art critic, of course, NCCA Chair De Leon, myself, and Renaud Proch of the independent curators based in New York. And uh, it took us two days to decide to choose the best.
we join you to celebrate with us the triumphant return of the Philippines to Venice Biennale International Art Exhibition. We are proud of the astounding diversity and multifaceted aspects of Philippine arts and culture. At the 56th edition of the Venice Biennale, we all look forward to sharing with the international audience the emergence of the Philippines as an important and rich culture. Again, to all the protagonists of this adventure, congratulations on this well-deserved historical opportunity. Welcome back to the Biennale. Italy awaits your team and artists, scholars, and organizers with open hearts. Congratulations. Thank you. God rules the heaven, but on earth, I rule. The main uh, pivot of the pavilion is the film Genghis Khan. I was thinking while I was reflecting on the proposal, what better way to come back with something that has already been in, in Venice. So I thought of Genghis Khan. At that time, Genghis was also in the festival as one of the classics of the festival. It was rescreened after it was exhibited in the festival in 1952. So it was uh, on my mind. And when I was at the Getty Research Institute in 2014, I was working on a project under the theme uh, Time and Scale in Philippine Modern Art. And uh, Genghis Khan was one of the topics of that research. So I was already studying Genghis Khan. So I developed a story about the world, about the possession of the world, how territories are gathered and possessed, and how uh, efforts to possess are also resisted no, by those who are possessed. So that's the main pivot or the main axis of the pavilion. The reason why we chose that of Patrick Flores and uh, the artists that he re represented here, you know, we want, we'd like to connect to the past. We'd like to connect to the very first ex uh, participation of the Philippines um, 51 years ago. And there was Genghis Khan then. And there's Genghis Khan now. Imagine, in, in a span of 51 years, there's a connecting thread. Out of 16, his entry was the most relevant, most contemporary. One of the most important issues facing the Philippines today has to do with, uh, well, the political imagination of people. You know, some imaginations have run haywire. So the, the political imagination of some other countries, or one country, run haywire, and uh, we have to make sure that uh, sanity is restored at least through art, without uh, incurring so much enmity, because we're going to do it politically and economically, and it might be better to use art, because art has a unifying quality, while politics and economics usually are divisive. So the moment we use art, it may persuade people in a more non-confrontational way, but at the same time, you, you, get your, you get your message across. In terms of the selection of the artists, I thought of artists who could best respond to the concerns of, of Genghis Khan. So that's one important criteria. You know? Secondly, I chose artists who have the discipline to uh, deliver uh, on the uh, needs of the project you know? because we were also we all we had limited time and so discipline was important so it was a combination of the right sensibility on the one hand and on the other the correct uh, working habits uh, on the part of, of the artist and uh, I have of course I had to I know these artists quite well. I've worked with them and I know their 
a body of work. So it's also important for the curator to know uh, their concerns as artists. And I thought that this was the best combination. We're in Buliluyan, the southernmost part of Palawan. Dr. Flores invited me to be part of the proposal and um, asked me if I can uh, make a film about the sea. I didn't realize that it was actually a proposal for an open call for the Viennese Binale. So later on, Dr. Flores just told me that it's going to be part of the proposal. And then later on, news came out that we were chosen. But also, I didn't realize that Venice Biniale is the oldest and the biggest Biniale in the world. The process of a dash state, it was inspired by the nine dashed line. So at first, I went to Puerto Princesa and then had my research. I talked to the mayor of Kalayaan Group of Islands, Mayor Bito Onon. And then um, he shared his experience no, in terms of leading the islands. No? And then um, at the same time, I read um, uh, news about what, what was happening in that area. So it actually inspired me to dig up more. And then I realized that through my process, I discovered Palawan tribe had epics. So these epics were last recorded in um, 1970s by an anthropologist and um, Dr. Nicole Rebel, and um, found out that these epics were actually really interesting to include in my work. So from uh, working on the sound and um, layers of it, it actually um, working with history and then the present um, and what the present is trying to do with history. So a Palawan, a member of a Palawan tribe may actually turn on the radio and just scan around the frequencies and then would listen to Chinese music. This has an influence to him and how he sees the world. And I see myself in that position. And these incursions actually happen around the world. The, the issue is not only about territories, but actually about uh, redefining the redefinition of cultures around the world and how each culture influences um, another. It's a sensitive matter and I see it as an important subject. Uh, the three-channel video is a um, peripheral vision covers the 180 degrees and how you analyze what you see happening at the same time, listening to things that you don't really understand, it will put you in a position wherein you will question yourself where you are. Um, my objective was actually to put the spectator in a dashed state. I felt that before I died, I'd achieved, I had achieved the dream. That's how I felt. Well, this is part of an entire team concept and Patrick told me that he would be setting what was the word a peg or uh, uh, just another word for it a eh? uh, pivot yeah. there was a pivot and the pivot would be the story of Genghis Khan and all its implications of worlds colliding of conquest of colonialism of resistance of people moving up. So it was a very rich uh, thing with which to work and at the same time it was political and real and it could be translated into contemporary situations. So I said, I like that. That's exactly how I like to do art. Not just about formalism but about context. I have had an image in my head for the last year and I think it's a nice image that would be the start. It is not going to be the end image, 
but it's the image of the BRP Sierra Madre on a Jungian shoal. And I asked him to check it out. And that, and he said, yep, that may work. And that's where we started to build the picture. One of my favorite images of velvet is on Good Friday to Holy Saturday, the saints are draped in velvet, sometimes wine-colored, sometimes maroon, sometimes a deep a purple. And then when the bells ring for Easter, they drop all the drapery. So I said, yeah, it reminds me of morning saints also. But velvet is such a sensuous material also that I said, you know, when, when you are thinking of the Biennale, you're thinking of being in an island with several hundred other artists and everybody needs attention and all the people viewing need only maybe 10-15 minutes of their time because they have 30 others 40 others to see every day in the limited time so i said yeah i want something that boom made the thing no yeah, sorry i mean you know i want something that when you enter the room in a monochrome and patrick and i agreed Sabi niya, patrick, uh, can we do something you know strong monochrome yeah yeah Sabi ko, i think i'm there also if it's not the bungee, which I, I, I was painful that it didn't happen, but scenario B, I think it's strong. It reminds also, because you know, we have this Filipino-only Catholic in Southeast Asia, and I think this will already speak a bit right away without saying anything. You feel Catholic, velvet. It doesn't feel Buddhist. You don't associate with Taoism. No, it's really Catholic. So I think you know, it speaks for us. One of the uh, traits or characteristics of the two works in the pavilion uh, is uh, intricacy. No? So the work of Tense Ruiz is very intricate. The wrapping of the boat with velvet is very dense and intricate. And the work of Montilibano is intricate as well in terms of the build-up of sound, of synchronizing elements images and uh, but at the same time he is also able to introduce disruptions in relation to these elements. Now, so there uh, was intricacy involved in the building up of the layers of, of sound uh, in relation to layers of images within a, uh, an environment of uh, three channels. As a curator, I wanted to tell a story, a strong story of current dispute and at the same time of a precocious modernity from the Philippines. And uh, the film Genghis Khan really broadens the, the perspective of the pavilion because it testifies to the robust modernity of the Philippines in the 50s that uh, Filipino filmmakers and uh, uh, visual artists were able to uh, make a film, the first film ever on on Genghis Khan. So I think this really is uh, an important achievement that the world has to know about in relation to contemporary art. Uh, the film world knows about Genghis Khan as film, but as uh, modern art, I think it has to be seen in a different context and also within uh, contemporary art. Uh, Genghis Khan is also an important figure in the emergence of the modern world. And then a film on him and that film seen in relation to the current dispute and the sea, I think really would amplify uh, the, uh, the meaning and significance of, of the pavilion.
that I am thoroughly thrilled that the Philippines is back in Venice after 51 long years, which is almost my age. It shows the um, intellectual rigor, the depth, the creativity, the brilliance of Dr. Patrick Flores. I, Patrick, we could not have a better choice than to have selected Patrick. And of course, our artists, it's good that we have someone like Jose Tense Ruiz uh, with this monumental installation, which seems like a bit claustrophobic, even for me, in this small room. But then he says, um, it's all about conquest and power, etc. And power and conquest is indeed claustrophobic. So perhaps that's the impact on me. The Dash Tate video of uh, Mani Mantelibano is amazing how he was able to use the uh, Palawan epic recorded uh, many decades ago and juxtaposed it with sounds of um, intrusion of the Chinese into a regular AM FM radio. So it's a take on Chinese hegemonic aggression in the West Philippine Sea, but contemporized and expressed in the multi-channel video of Manny Mantelibano. And of course, the beautifully restored Genghis Khan, which was the entry in the 1952 Venice Film Fest, is now uh, sitting in dialogue with this show and with the Dash Tape multi-channel video. So all these creative interplay of various forms of art uh, awaits people from all walks of life all over the world in this three room Philippine pavilion here in Venice. It is written in the stars that the day will come when I'll tie a spring around the world and lead it to your feet. I would also like to tell you the good news that just today, the AN, the artist information based in the UK and Europe, with over 19,000 members of artists, students, producers, creators, etc., and supports visual arts practice, etc., had declared that the Philippine Pavilion is one of the 10 must see pavilions out of 89 national pavilions. The Philippine Pavilion opened last May 8th, uh, and the vital part of its vision and discourse is the performance Dreaming Paglao of David Medalla in collaboration with Adam and Curtis. It is but totally fitting for these performances to belong to the Philippine Pavilion and offer another layer of insight and intelligence to the argument of world making in the past and in the future from one of global art history's most important world makers, David Medalla.